thank you, Dr. Honig. Uh, I usually call you Tom. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, I've been a longtime admirer of you for many years. For, for those of you who don't know who are listening to this, I'm from Kansas City. Uh, as we talked, Tom ran the Kansas City Fed had a very illustrious career there, as well as at the FDIC. And so we're, we're thrilled to have Tom here at Global Perspectives. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, to Tom a little bit about his career, um, uh, some lessons learned. We're, we're certainly going to talk about the economy. Uh, we're going to take your questions. Uh, and so with that, uh, uh, welcome Tom Honig uh, to the Dallas Fed. Well, thank you. thank you very much, Rob. It is, it is indeed a pleasure for me, especially since you are also a Kansas City, Kansas City native. And uh, it's also a pleasure for me to join you in this, um, this experiment, uh, and to be honest. It should be fun. Thank you. Okay. So let me start. We're going to talk a little bit about you first, and then we're going to talk about the world. Uh, first of all, what made you become an economist? Well, uh, those are, you know, you're influenced by your environment, I guess, but I, um, my background is from a relatively small community where uh, at both agriculture and industry and where markets and uh, market prices and changing market conditions were a constant uh, consideration. And, and so you, you kind of go to that. And then when I went to college, of course, one of the first things I did was take a course in economics, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, really fit my interest. And so after that, they, like they say, the, the rest is history. I went on and uh, got, the, got my PhD in economics and have enjoyed my career, professional career in that field uh, for most of my life now. What was the topic of your PhD? It was actually on the, uh, the, the comparisons in a way of the banking industry and uh, non-banking industry. We didn't call it shadow banks at that time, uh, but that's kind of what it was. And so uh, it was on that area. And then uh, my other, my major field was in monetary policy. So money and banking was my field of interest and my, my dissertation focused on the kind of the banking side of that money and banking. And you started your career at the Federal Reserve. What brought, what brought you to the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City back in the early 70s? Well, it's like, like so many things. Uh, I really, uh, my goal was to actually join the Federal Reserve. I didn't have a particular strong interest in teaching at the time. Um, I'd been in the service, done some things. And so by that time, I really wanted to focus on the the policy and the implementation of monetary policy and banking. And so the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago were in the Midwest. I, I talked with both and uh, was fortunate enough to have been offered positions by both, but I chose Kansas City. Uh, that is where my wife's from, so it made, it made imminent sense at the time. And then rolling forward to 1991, you became uh, 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 President and Chief Executive Officer of the bank and uh, were in that role for uh, uh, 20 years. What, what was the most important experience, most important lesson you learned uh, being president of Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City? Well, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll back up just a little bit. Uh, when Please. I was at the bank, uh, I was in charge of, uh, of banking and bank supervision for some time, uh, especially during the, uh, the crisis of the uh, 80s. Uh, and at that period, that was a period where asset values, both agriculture, land, real estate, energy, uh, had really ballooned out. And uh, as a result of that, uh, when Paul Volcker took on the issue of taming inflation, this part of the world kind of fell apart. And you can see the collapse in asset values, the bankruptcies that followed, and the very dear hardships that uh, people experienced. And so that really formed my thinking and influenced me uh, as I went forward. And then having monetary policy, um, if you will, education background and banking background, it really prepared me for when I became president. And so as president, um, one of my concerns was to, 
it wasn't just general price inflation, but it was very, uh, I was very aware of asset bubbles, of how they can fester. Uh, and so those were some of the main areas that I focused on during my presidency, both as we had the dot-com, bu- dot-com bubble, bubble and then later uh, to actually the, the prime lending, uh, subprime lending uh, housing markets uh, later in the in the decade following the dot com bubble, so those were the experiences that I uh, I took with me and was influenced most of my most of my career as president of the bank. Okay, so we're we're going through, and we'll come back to it in a moment. We're going through uh, economic. Uh, crisis right now, economic challenge. You went one, through one, as you talked about, during 2008 and 2009, and the aftermath of that. Uh, what, what, what did you learn? What was the, what were some of the lessons you learned from that crisis? Well, that crisis was um, kind of self-inflicted. This crisis is not self-inflicted, I think, in many ways, hopefully. Um, and so what I was concerned about then, even as it was built up um, in 2004 and 2005, was the fact that we had, uh, and we were still, we, we had, had this period of low interest rates, and we were very slow to reverse that. And as a result, uh, I could see in 2005, 2006, this bubble uh, beginning to build, and so that was a major concern to me. And so when we went into it, I was... Uh, frankly, very much supportive of the steps that were taken then in the sense of, of I would say, reluctant support and the fact that you had to do it, you, you uh, had no choice um, to, to get us through that crisis, to get things uh, back moving forward. So uh, no problem there. And then, but in 2010, when we started, when the Federal Reserve started uh, and I was a part of the Open Market Committee in 2010 and, and took QE2 on and QE3, I was very concerned because we were uh, easing substantially into a recovery. And so I was concerned about the misallocation of resources that come with uh, low interest rates, um, kind of suppressed interest rates by that kind of policy. And so it did give me some pause to see how the economy was going uh, and whether or not we might be building a new um asset uh, mm. kind of expansion, and, and that, that was a major concern. And, and, the, and the, possible out, uh, the possible outcome of inflation later on, which uh, we did not experience other than in the asset side of that uh, inflation issue. Uh, and I know supervision was a, a big issue leading into that crisis. What's in, in hindsight? What, what lessons do you learn about uh, bank capital? Uh, we ultimately developed uh, tougher capital requirements for banks, stress testing. But what, what lessons do you learn about supervision that led to that crisis? Well, supervisors um, are like most other people; they tend to be influenced by the cycle they're in. And what you know, one of the one of the early lessons I learned from a uh, kind of a mentor of a central banker was the, the role of the supervisor is to swim against the current, not with yeah. it. Uh, and so when we were in the, when we were involved in a continuous easing, uh, my instincts were to, to be cautious about that, not, not necessarily impede it, but to be cautious about it. And I was very committed uh, and still am to the role of capital, not as a, cure-all, not that it would uh, end all crises or uh, uh, make everyone healthy, but because it is a, a, a in and of itself, a um, protection f- about from mistakes. So capital gives management the opportunity to take risk and to uh, make mistakes without bringing the entire institution down. And the less capital you have, then the smaller the margin for those mistakes, the less yeah. time you have to recover from those mistakes. And so that's why the focus on capital. And and I'm talking uh, finally just the, the importance of what we call tangible capital, that loss absorbing capital. Uh, I was not uh, impressed with the risk 
antiquated system at all. Uh, and that was another area that I, um, I did have comments on and raised concerns about during that period. Now, you were, uh, it's fair to say, uh, and correct me if, uh, if you disagree with this characterization, you were known during those years as a hawk, and I think you alluded to it, because I think you were worried that we were, there were excesses either on rates or on QE as we were heading into recovery. Uh, how would you describe your views regarding uh, monetary policy, and is the, is the, is the title hawk uh, uh, appropriate? Well, I mean, during the period that I was voting, uh, I certainly was um, concerned about keeping interest rates low and keeping them closer to zero and doing quantitative easing. So in that sense, you could call me a hawk. But I would also tell you that um, when the rates were prior to the 2007 period and yeah. rates were being raised, I raised concerns about uh, – going too fast on the upside. And I used to call it uh, bouncing against the wall. So you would, you would be worried about inflation, so you'd raise rates until you finally went too high and then your, your economy would come down and you keep them low until the uh, excess is built and the bubble is built and then you raise them high. And, uh, and so it's, it's really that um, volatile uh, conduct of monetary policy that I was most concerned with. And I happen to be on the on the side where rates were kept very long for a very long period of time, were very low for a very long period of time, and that's where the hawk title probably would be uh, applied. Now you uh, you left the Fed in 2011, and you pretty quickly thereafter became vice chairman of the FDIC. How different? Uh, is the FDIC from the Fed, and how did you experience that transition? Uh, the transition was fairly simple for me because I've been involved in banking supervision uh, for most of my career, uh, including as president. Um, and the and the agencies are more similar than people might think. They have a, a formal structure. They uh, have very committed staff, a long-serving staff. Uh, so I, I, it was a pretty easy transition. Uh, the FDIC is more narrowly uh, focused. Uh, they're focused on um, the deposit insurance system and on bank supervision, uh, whereas the Federal Reserve is involved in bank supervision, monetary policy, and payments. So it's, it's a broader uh, focus, but, this, but otherwise they're very similar in personality and culture uh, and in commitment of the staff uh, towards the supervision field itself. So, so is, let's, let's move now uh, a little bit to the situation we face today. Um, as, um, as you assess the economic situation today, what, what are your comments on uh, the, the, uh, the COVID virus uh, crisis that we've had here and the Fed's response to it? Well, the, the, the COVID crisis is, uh, is just incredibly devastating. I think we all see it. There's no one listening in or either you or I would think that this is anything but a major catastrophe that, that we face. Uh, and in that, uh, when you see the number of businesses across the country from the very largest to uh, the small business uh, entrepreneur, you get a feel for just how devastating that this crisis is on our economic system. So when you say that, and then you, then you think about, well, the, the Fed's policies, well, you know, in a different time and place, these policies would be very, very uh, aggressive expansionary. Uh, but in these circumstances, uh, who, who would, you know, who really would fault the Fed for taking these actions, because what we're trying to do is save, save the, save the institution, save the country's economic system, uh, and that requires all hands on deck. Now, with that, uh, I don't think there's any way to avoid putting these programs forward and being aggressive about it. Um, I, I think, as we do so, we also have to think 
down the road, uh, how we might exit it, and it, 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 because it's going to be a very, very difficult exit, we all yeah. realize. So, but the first things first, and right now we've got to get the economy, we've got to get the economy through this, this terrible uh, disaster. So, so some people have commented about the interaction and interplay, and you saw this in 08, 09 to some extent, but it's even more today, the interplay between what we're doing at the Fed and uh, the Treasury Department and the Congress. And in particular, many of these so-called, uh, for the audience, 13-3 programs, meaning we are setting up a series, and we're all working on this, a series of uh, special purpose vehicles to buy uh, everything from commercial paper to corporate bonds to uh, you know, municipal debt uh, uh, and other asset classes. What, what's, what's your reaction? And some people have said, boy, is the Fed losing some independence uh, b because you're, you're, you're working so hand in glove with the Treasury? What's your, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think the, the, the issue is ahead of the Fed, in my own opinion. Right now, everyone agrees we have to do this. And I, I find it interesting that when uh, after the last crisis, the, the, the law was changed so that the Fed had to go to the Treasury to ask permission to use 13.3. And I've always said um, the, the Treasury is the political arm. I don't think that will be a holdup, and I don't think it is, nor will it be. Um, so, but the, the Fed is acting, I think, with the greatest interest of the country at heart, and the Treasury is acting with the greatest uh, interest of the country at heart. Now, there's politics behind that, maybe, but they're both doing that. And that's, uh, that doesn't suggest that one's working for the other. The difficulty will be in the future yeah. when you have to begin to unwind this. And the political element, obviously and importantly, will want to do that very slowly. And the Fed um, may be um, willing to do it slowly, but will be uh, concerned about its ability to conduct monetary policy uh, going forward. We don't know what the uh, uh, distributional effects of this policy will be once we get through the crisis. These are all unknown. These are questions that have unknown answers at the moment, but they will become center stage later on. And that's when the Fed will uh, uh, be put to the test in terms of its independence. And, and Rob, you know this, it's not unlike the post-World War II accord where the Fed, having supported the issuance of debt during World War II, then at the end had to uh, re regain its independence through the accord, and it was very stressful uh, for the Federal Reserve in that period. That's where I think, the, uh, to use the expression, the rubber will hit the road and we'll find out if, in fact, uh, the Fed can uh, maintain its independence uh, during the follow-up period. Okay. I've got more questions I'm going to ask you, but I actually feel like this might be a good time uh, to turn to Mark Wynn and take questions from the audience. Okay. So why don't we do that? Okay. So here's one that was submitted uh, by one of the registrants. Um, when do you think the U.S. and global economies will be back to where they were in January? How quickly will we recover? And what indicators should we be looking at to see that we're on a solid trajectory after the pandemic? Um, well, I, my own view is, um, as you look at the depth of this um, recession, I think we're in the process of entering right now, and the number of firms being affected, the number of jobs lost, it will take us some time, this, this country and the world, to, uh, broader, to uh, become fully recovered. And I, I, I would say, uh, now, the, the, there's no science behind this. There's no model behind this. It's the experience I've had in past uh, crises that, I, that I'm kind of using as my gaze, but I really think 24 months to, to 30 months before we're in full recovery. And back to where we were uh, just before this, it could be longer because uh, we were in a very – uh, boom-like economy here just a few weeks ago. So that will take perhaps a little longer. But to be healthy again, I think we will start back uh, in, in 12 months and then work our way through 24 and then hopefully be 
uh, in pretty good shape in 30. Now, that seems like a long time right now to some people, but in the context of economic events, um, I think it's, it's a reasonable guesstimate, uh, if you will. And then what to look for? Uh, we'll, well, we'll look to see, first of all, um, that we, business start rehiring. That'll be the most important thing um, because I will show there is demand out there, uh, their ability to um, uh, begin to engage in international business once again, uh, with putting these trade issues aside. Uh, those will be important indicators that we are returning to a more normal set of circumstances because people are going to be very tentative here. I mean, both internationally and domestically in terms of health, in terms of how much uh, investment to commit, uh, is, is, do we have a staying power? And that has to build, I think, and build confidence uh, through that. So that's my best outlook at the moment. Let's take another one, Mark. Okay, another question. Do you have estimates for how costly this crisis might be compared to other recent crises, such as the 9-11 events or the global financial crisis of a decade ago? Will this be comparable or worse? Um, my, my judgment is it will be worse, uh, easily worse. Uh, I've seen the uh, IMF numbers of the global GDP falling 3%. That's from an earlier projection of plus 3%. That's a 6 percentage point swing. Uh, when you think of the speed with which the, un the, the unemployment is increasing, uh, the initial claims, um, this, this is going to be, this is going to be more, more difficult. In terms of cost, um, I think it will be, uh, well, we already know that we have uh, the, the Treasury is increasing its spending dramatically. We know we're going to have at least a two to three, well, it looks like a three trillion dollar deficit. That, that's that's a cost. Our spending will go from five billion with one billion borrowed to um, eight to nine billion with uh, uh, only uh, with with uh, with three or four billion borrowed. I said uh, four billion borrowed. I meant four billion revenues, one billion borrowed. This will be much higher, three three billion borrowed. So it's going to be expensive to come out of this, and the, the, it'll take time. I think one of the challenges ahead will be how we how we manage that debt uh, and how we contain uh, the negative effects from that debt in the next during the next decade. Remember that the debt will be uh, the debt in 2010 started at about 11 trillion dollars. A year ago was $22 trillion. Next year or the year after, it'll be $30 trillion. That's a huge increase to manage. And the Fed's balance sheet, uh, Bob knows this better than I do, is $6 trillion now and will probably be something substantially larger than that before this is over. That has to be dealt with. So the costs are both immediate in terms of the cost and spending and long-term in terms of the management of a, a very uh, fragile economic system going forward. So, so, Tom, let me follow up on that. A lot of people have asked sure, the please. question, um, how are we going to, how, on the, uh, on the fiscal side, uh, what are the implications of running deficits this big on growth, productivity, and with the likelihood of uh, a future tax policy? Well, it's hard to know, of course, but I would say, first of all, the, think about it, you have this debt. So much there'll be so much pressure on the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates down because the cost of carry on this debt, uh, if interest rates were to go up, would be horrendous, and that would interfere with the private sector's ability to to borrow and recover itself. Because if interest rates go up uh, and you compete for funds to fund their deficit and the borrowing is necessary to um, uh, have the economy rebound, those are very difficult. Um, challenges, and uh, you have this issue of what comes first, the private sector, the public sector, as you deal with it. And with this kind of debt and this kind of a carry, it, you begin to um, have difficulties with the allocation of resources to, to their greatest need. And you put more into the public sector, less into the private sector uh, productivity is um, impeded to some degree. Hopefully not too much, but to some degree it will happen. 
Uh, and then I think there are going to be new issues and new debates that are going to come out of this. Uh, we all, some of us have heard, I know you have, Rob, of the so-called uh, modern monetary theory where you can yeah. manage everything by just printing money and doing fiscal policy. That's going to be a challenge going forward. There will be a lot of people say, hey, we did it. We printed all this money. Let's do it some more. We'll, we'll be fine. And uh, then the, the outcomes of that can be very, very negative. So we have, we have such, such enormous challenges ahead of us, which we can handle because, um, because number one, we are still the greatest industrial country in the world. But that doesn't happen by itself. We're going to have to do some very careful uh, thinking and some very careful policy decisions. And uh, I think that will be a major challenge uh, for the times. What are the implications, uh, given uh, speaking of mono, modern monetary uh, theory, what are the implications, negative implications you're referring to of potentially printing, uh, printing money and, in effect, monetizing the debt? Well, the, you know, the issue over time will be if you if you print this money, you monetize the debt. That means the Federal Reserve is putting that debt on its balance sheet. Uh, to, to keep that from becoming uh, recirculating into the economy, they're going to have to pay uh, interest on those excess reserves to keep them sterile, keep them out of the out of the economy, so that you don't uh, invite inflationary pressures. That means you're going to have um, uh, effects on interest rates. Uh, it will uh, allocate things differently. Uh, and then there will, will be the argument that uh, as long as you can print money, you can handle the debt, which, uh, and if you get inflation, we'll cut back on the fiscal spending, which I think will be very, very difficult. Uh, it sounds great in theory, but in practice, it's it's a significant challenge. So that you, you build, you'll continue to build the debt. You continue to put enormous pressure on the central bank to uh, buy that debt, either directly or indirectly, uh, to then to keep it from recirculating the economy and cause inflation. You have to pay interest on those reserves. Um, it, it becomes kind of its own vicious uh, circle uh, until finally something something gives, and it'll probably be uh, either another uh, financial crisis where asset values suddenly collapse because of the, of the weight of the of the so much money being out there and finally people losing confidence, or it will be a very strong inflationary cycle that no one anticipates right now but uh, could could easily surface. We're not immune for, from it. We know that from the period of the 70s, uh, and yeah. we shouldn't take it for granted. So it's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mark, let's take other questions. So a related question, what do you think is the most likely way that the problem will be dealt with? How will the debt burden be worked down by tax increases, spending reductions, higher inflation, or some combination of the three? Well, uh, let me first say that if we could get the economy back in uh, some uh, element of stability, so we're 12 months, 24 months down the road, and we can get the real economy growing or the economy growing at a rate faster than the debt is growing, then, uh, and we're careful, we can, uh, that can be a part of the growing out of the debt burden that is there, but that's a very deep challenge. Um, if we don't do that uh, and the pressures are such that we can't, then I think we are going to see uh, the opportunity to see inflation rebuild and uh, so that you basically use the inflation uh, as the tax uh, that would help um, uh, that will help make the debt less burdensome, right? It devalues the devalues the the, the debt uh, as, a, as in terms of paying it back. So that'd be that could be part of it. And finally, I I would suspect that there will be pressures to increase taxes um, uh, as a means to help do that. So you're going to get some combination of those three. Um, I prefer the first. I prefer that the economy be uh, allowed to run uh, as a private economy with the industrial uh, uh, ingenuity, uh, the, the entrepreneur elements of the economy, building that economy so that it grows faster than the debt. But that will take then some discipline on the fiscal side, on the Congress side, to uh, not you know, you know, not pull back all the spending at once, but to make sure that it doesn't continue to increase 
at a rate faster than the economy can absorb it, that is, can grow and bring that down relative to the economy over time. Uh, if you can do that, then there's less need for burdensome taxes, and uh, taxes, are, depending on who you ask, are already an issue. Uh, so those are those are the those are the alternatives. Probably some part of each. I hope it's the growth side of that solution, not the tax or the inflation side of that solution. Mark, let's take other questions. Another question. How do you see uh, business or society changing permanently as a result of the current pandemic? Uh, another great question. I, I, here, here's how I've described it. I, I really, I mean, this is, this is a traumatic experience for the U.S., its people, its economy overall. I do think, though, that what this pandemic is showing, and as we move out of it, we, what we're going to see is a basically an acceleration of trends that are already in place. And by that, I mean we'll see uh, an increase of um, uh, remote buying, that is, uh, uh, the Amazons of the world and so forth, I think, will uh, become more dominant uh, through time. We will see um, a home officing uh, become more common. Uh, we will see, uh, I think, uh, a, a, a tendency to spend, to have the government spend more money. Uh, that worries me a lot. But that's a trend that was already in place. And to the extent that that solution in terms of pumping money into the economy works to help uh, tame this uh, economic uh, upheaval, then people will have even more confidence, which means the government will become a more dominant role, play a more dominant role in the economy over time. And I don't know that that's going to necessarily bring us the greatest productivity over time, but that is, I think, a possible part of the trend forward. So it, it'll be more of the same, only, only more aggressively so would be how I would describe it. Because we will normalize and we will uh, use this experience to move things uh, as they were, if not more rapidly. So uh, leading into this crisis, Tom, um, uh, business fixed investment was sluggish. Manufacturing was sluggish. Uh, global trade had also been, as we know, uh, because of trade tensions, sluggish. And the one bright spot in the economy was the consumer. We had a tight job market, and uh, consumer balance sheets were in pretty good shape. It is, and so the, the, the main engine of the economy was the consumer. As we head into this new period, uh, what do you think is going to be the main engine of growth that is going to help us uh, uh, you know, you know, move beyond this crisis. Well, I, I think that, g given the the efforts being put forward to support the consumer, I think the consumer will reemerge uh, okay. as the, as a principal part. Because number one, remember, even after the last crisis, and the consumer was one of the main victims of that yes. crisis. When you think of it, uh, the consumer came back, and so we have a tendency in this country to. Um, um, look to the consumer. Uh, we give uh, encouragement to the consumer, and I think we will do it again. Now, I hope, and this is one of the worries I have about the government's role, if it becomes uh, increasingly uh, dominant within the economy in terms of its spending, it's, if we get into uh, uh, it taking on this greater role, then I think that might actually hurt productivity and and hurt the investments in capital that you necessarily need for improved productivity. And that should because be it squeezes out about. the private sector. Is that why? Absolutely. Right. But well, think about it. If, if, if all your, if, if your borrowing is there and it's primarily being pulled by the government because of these huge yeah. deficits yeah. Uh, and you, how, how, how does the private sector compete with us? Now I, I assume what they're, what the, Fed, the pressure on the Fed will be to keep that yield curve as flat as possible so that yeah. the private sector and the public sector can both borrow. But I don't know how that's going to turn out. I, I'm not sure anyone does for sure. I, I don't see it necessarily working. Because you're worried it's going to be inflationary. Well, if you do that over time, it should be. 
yeah. unless we've really become very productive, which uh, the recent past doesn't suggest we will. And that was one of our, you know, the recent past was really our, our boom economy. So yeah. it's it'll be very delicate uh, as far as the policymakers go to make sure that have faith in the private sector to be able to pull us out and keep us going uh, and, and give that uh, an opportunity to work. And I think that's under under challenge right now and will be following this crisis. Okay. Mark, other questions? Here's another one. Um, do you think the Fed is undermining its credibility by punishing savers and forcing investors to invest in risky assets for higher rates of return? Candidly, I do. I think the last decade of uh, suppressed rates uh, have um, have not served the savers as well. Now, the, the answer to that is um, the fact that during the stock market and the stock market doing well and so forth, I understand that. But uh, the fundamentals of saving, the fundamentals of pension funds, I mean, the pension funds in the, in the, in the, uh, in the United States are heavily underfunded in some instances because of these very suppressed rates, and, and they're not in a position necessarily to go into the high-risk assets. So it has, there has been a subsidization of the, by the saver to the debtor uh, that has caused some of the misallocation of resources, some of the maldistribution of, of wealth. Uh, and I, think, I don't think we should deny that. I think we should t t take a look at it. I know that, in fact, uh, I fully understand why we were uh, willing to take actions in the last crisis necessary to bring us out of that. But we need to let the economy uh, run as, a, as an economy should, with savers and investors providing the, the necessary fuel and going forward to invest in productive goods. Uh, and then I think we would be better off in the long run. And I felt that then. I felt that now. I feel that now. And now I say that, but don't misunderstand me. I understand that right now we're in a crisis, so we have to do what's necessary to get through this crisis. I'm, I was a decade talking long-term, and tonight I'm telling you we have to think long-term as well because we really have to get through this and then think about how to encourage investment, encourage productivity. Uh, I think that's, that's where the emphasis should be. Mark, other questions? If there is another wave of this epidemic in the fall, or if another unforeseen disaster happens in the next 12 months or so, do central banks have any more ammunition? The, the, the answer to that now, Rob, again, this may be something you'd want to answer, but I, let me tell yeah. you, that there's one tool that the central banks have, but the, particularly the central bank of the United States, the ability to create money, create money. that is a tool. And that's what they're doing now. Now, they, they use that tool in a variety of ways. Uh, as, as Rob said, we have the, uh, a policy for uh, Main Street uh, uh, borrowers. We have a policy for liquidity. We have, but it's all supported by and made possible by that ability to create money uh, as necessary. And so that's the tool. It's a tool we had last time. It's a tool we have this time. It's a tool we have in the future. The question will be, uh, do, we, do we wear the tool out in terms of the, the negative effects of printing money to such an extent? Hopefully, uh, we won't have a recurrence of this pandemic. We will get this thing figured out. We will get it under control. And hopefully, we won't have another uh, outside shock or self-inflicted wound over that period so that we can, in fact, work our way out. And I think... I think we have the ability to, to work our way out of it. Uh, we, we may not be able to prevent natural disasters uh, of this magnitude. Hopefully we can, uh, but we have the wherewithal to deal with this going forward. And the central bank has a, a very powerful tool in its hands that it needs to use well. Keep going, Mark. Uh, do you see any risk to the future role of the dollar as the world's reserve currency as a result of these policies that we are pursuing to address the pandemic? Well, there's always a risk uh, in terms of uh, 
the, the role of the reserve currency, the volatility that might uh, come with that. But I will tell you, um, I don't think that the I don't think the dollar is a reserve currency because it's the dollar. I think the dollar is a reserve currency because the United States still is the strongest industrial country on the face of the earth. It still has the ability to create wealth through its uh, very significant uh, resources. Uh, it has the entrepreneurial spirit uh, and abilities that most other countries, many other countries, not most, many other countries uh, lack. Um, so we have we have we have so many things that make us the desired uh, reserve currency that I think that's that's the main that's the main point. Now, one other thing, um, we are printing a lot of money, and that is an issue. But remember this: this, it, this is a little bit like grading on the curve. Uh, other countries are unable to uh, substitute for us because they're not uh, any. They, they're in the same uh, difficult bind that we are right now, having to print money to manage through this pandemic. Uh, Tom, as you think through your career, what were, were some of the role models that you look to, um, and and uh, were guides to you in your career? Well, um, first of all, in my in my own career history, uh, I I would very fortunate. I had some outstanding mentors within the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Um, they, they gave me responsibility. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to, to learn and to make mistakes. And so they were certainly uh, uh, Roger Guffey, former president, Will Billington, a former executive there, were strong uh, help to me in building my career and understanding what was going on. Then others, um, I, I, I Thoroughly admired Paul Volcker. Uh, I, I was around when he was the chairman. I thought he set an enormously positive example of courage, thoughtfulness, um, and calm under under pressure. Uh, you couldn't have had a better example and role model to follow at that point. So those are those are just three names I pull out there, and uh, there are others who certainly influenced my career, uh, but those were the ones I think of for the moment. Uh, what makes a good uh, Federal Reserve Chairman, Chairman or Chairwoman? Um, well, you have to. I think. I think the most important thing that you have is the ability to listen and understand, um, and that means you have some. You have some training in, in areas uh, where where bank, banking and finance. Uh, are familiar to you. I don't think you have to be, by any means, uh, you don't have to be an economist at all. You have to have just the necessary background. And, but more important than even that, or as important as that, is the ability to listen and to understand. Uh, because a lot of people think they have the answer, uh, and then if they fail to listen, they miss very important points. And so the key to a chairperson is that is that very necessary ability. And then, of course, uh, the ability to actually make a decision. Um, there are a lot of smart people out there. I, I admire them greatly, but if they can't make a decision, nothing gets done. And uh, that means the final part of it is the courage to make a decision with a great deal of uncertainty around around that decision. Because no one has the perfect knowledge. If you did, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a hard decision at all. But most decisions are difficult. You don't have all the information, uh, so that's why you listen, you think about it, you use your experience, and then you decide, uh, and you, uh, I think, will be most effective that way. And what makes a excellent uh, Federal Reserve Bank president? The same things, uh, exactly the same things. Because president, you know very well, Rob, you have a you have a big operation there. There's a lot of money that flows through that. That organization of yours, there's a lot of supervision that takes place. There's a payment system that's changing rapidly. Um, those are all necessary ingredients for running that operation. Uh, you have to have the additional, I guess, what I'll call interpersonal skills because you work with 11 other presidents and under normal times, uh, seven governors, one of them being the chairman of the Federal Reserve. 
so those those become very important as well and um, it, it is it, it is that ability to listen decide uh, and act with courage that I think makes all the difference in the world so, so so over the years what would you what what and as you observe the Federal Reserve and you working at the Fed and then now on outside the Fed what's your biggest concern about the Federal Reserve if you were giving advice to those of us who do work at the Fed what would your advice be I would I think a um, a central banker once told me uh, years ago said that the central bank's role is to the long to look to the long term so that the short term can take care of itself. <clears throat> and I think the central banks have over the last <clears throat> excuse me, the last two decades have had to deal with, with crises, short term events, uh, and understandably so. I mean that's part of the central bank's role as lender of last resort, as financial stability participant. But it forces them to look to the short term and sometimes I think uh, has forced them to take their eye off the long-term role that they have. And that long-term role is to give the economy um, the necessary stability, but the necessary patience. They, the central bank has to be patient to let the markets adjust, to let the innovation take place without uh, trying to overstimulate or, or bring it back too quickly. <laughs> and those are the sorts of things that I think central banks have to turn to as we get through this pandemic is, is really look to that long run. And and that's even more challenging today, Rob, because the, the, the fiscal side, the Congress, is by the very nature, in the United States at least, that it's elected, has a short-term cycle. It, it's focused on the short term almost by, um, by the way it's structured. So that puts even more pressure on the central bank to be uh, more patient, uh, to be very thoughtful in the outlook, and to take those policies uh, and res restrain itself uh, in, in, in some times to make sure we get the right long-term outcome as well as the short-term fix. So, so setting this crisis aside for a moment, one of the criticisms that has been made of the Fed um, uh, and one of the concerns in this country more generally has been income and wealth inequality. And I think some have said that the policies of the Fed have done, uh, have done a lot to help uh, asset prices, but maybe have not done as much. Uh, although I think recently the Fed has gone to great lengths to try to uh, create full employment and bring in underrepresented groups into the labor force. But I think there's been a comment that Fed policies may have fed in particular wealth inequality because of uh, the impact of our policies on asset prices. What, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think there's some merit to that, uh, that observation. I think the, you know, the very fact that you systematically keep interest rates low uh, and just like a, just like a bond, the, you know, if you lower interest rates, the price goes up. You have the effect of, uh, of moving asset values up. So if you are amongst the asset holding class, to use that term, uh, maybe a poor use of that term, but to that group, that asset holding class is going to benefit more than uh, others that, that are not in that group, that are um, lower wage or some lower middle class, even some middle class, uh, they're going to uh, gain less than the others. So you do get a you do get a shift. You do get a proportional shift that way. And that is perhaps what we're seeing. Now, I, it doesn't mean that I, that I fail to recognize the, one of the reasons you're trying to do that is to get the economy going again. But I think uh, it has other consequences that uh, are real. Uh, so we have to be mindful of that. And I think we should look back on the past decade to think about how we address the next decade. Because the challenges we had this last decade um, – Deficits that are very substantial, uh, a Federal Reserve balance sheet that is uh, more than anyone thought it would ever be, um, pressure on interest rates, the pressure to fund the debt without rates. Those are all those are all challenges that the central bank has to face 
uh, and has to be able to explain to the Congress who it reports to and is responsible to so that we can maintain uh, this ability to create wealth in this country that has raised every generation to a new level. And we don't want to we don't want to sacrifice that uh, for short term uh, uh, moments. And uh, it, it is to, I, I said years ago that I think zero interest rates or something very close to zero interest rate is not um, a stable equilibrium for an economic yeah. system. Yeah. And, that, and the more you try and force that, the more fragility you bring to your system. And that's what I worry about. So I, I would assume you would hope in the aftermath of this situation, we might adjust rates so that there, uh, that we'll have the courage to raise rates to to a more appropriate level when the when the economy allows. Yeah, I, I I think that'll be a I think that'll be a major challenge, uh, Rob, because the, the difficulty is the amount of debt that we have to finance will put yeah. incredible pressure. Because the first time you know, I mean, a little bit, the repo uh, explosion last uh, yeah. fall was, was a little bit of a reflection of that um, need to fund the the, the federal debt um, yeah. at, at low interest rates. Otherwise, they'll yeah. go up and you'll have a whole set of problems. Yeah, and for those who are listening, what, what Tom's referring to is we had in the fall uh, – Short-term overnight borrowing rates between banks spiked, uh, and we came to the conclusion that um, we needed to raise the level of reserves in the system, and we need to intervene. But the reason it's one of one of the reasons it spiked is the substantial amount of Treasury issuance, which affected the Treasury general account, and so indirectly. What the what the Fed was doing, you're saying, if it was facilitating this dramatic increase, this before this crisis, dramatic increase in uh, in Treasury issuance. That, that's correct. Thank you. Very well said. Um, so uh, we're getting down to the last few minutes. We've got a we've got a uh, large group that have joined us tonight. Many of them uh, by their uh, by the fact that they're joining are interested in public affairs, want to help the community want to help society. Uh, you've, been a, you've been a leader for your entire career uh, in the community in Kansas City, I know firsthand, and in the public sector. Any advice for the business and other leaders and the young people in the audience about what they can do that to, in their careers and in their, in their private lives to help serve and uh, improve the, their community and the country? Well, I think that the the only advice I can give is, is advice that was given to me, and that is um, always be willing to, if starting with your own job, always be willing to take on the next task and do it as well as you can, and then always, always reach out within your community to provide support broadly. Uh, and uh, when you do that, you, you serve all best, including yourself. All right, very good. Tom, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your leadership. And I would say to everyone who is on this call tonight, I hope you're uh, uh, safe, that your family is well, uh, that you're uh, practicing, continue to practice social distancing as we are tonight. Uh, but, but I also uh, want to say to you, um, in my own view, uh, playing a key role in this situation uh, as a Federal Reserve Bank president, uh, I'm confident that we'll work through this crisis uh, and we'll come out the other side and we'll, uh, we, we will move forward as a country. And so uh, I appreciate, Tom, you being here tonight. I appreciate your leadership, and I thank all of you for being on this call. And so I wish everybody a, a, a happy and healthy uh, good evening. And, and, Rob, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to join you here this evening. Thank you, Tom.